Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Adam Mahalski. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. And thank you for joining us tonight for our presentation, uh, New Chapters Discovered in Nevada Suffrage and Railroad History. Uh, we're doing this in collaboration with uh, the Nevada Women's History Project. Um, and so this is a, a project we've been working on for a few months now. And we've uh, found some really interesting stories that uh, relate to women's suffrage and railroads, like, because who doesn't like both of those subjects, right? <laughs> so we uh, have a presentation tonight with um, Mona Reno of the Nevada Women's History Project, and she will be uh, giving her portion of the presentation. And then we also have uh, a presentation with um, our curator of history, Wendell Huffman and uh, he will be presenting after Mona. But first, we will start with uh, Mona's presentation, and um, if you're ready, we can, we can start. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the Nevada State Railroad Museum for making this all happen, and thank you to Patty Bernard, who is at home recovering. Uh, as you can see on the uh, entry slide, this was Patty's vision, She's been researching this and she gave me a great outline. And so for months now, we have been working on this project, as Adam said. So here we go. So the first thing is what is suffrage? We get that a lot, you know. And so um, this is what suffrage is. And uh, men and women and people of all races and ethnicity have the very same word when it relates to their right to vote all over the world. That's the key term. It's been fought for uh, many times. So our Nevada Railroad history starts um, with uh, a suffrage convention in Battle Mountain. It was a brand new railroad stop um, in Battle Mountain for the Central Pacific Railroad. And on July 4th, which is a couple days from now, um, that will be 150 years since that very first women's suffrage convention. And it was that date is still 50 years before uh, women got the right to vote with the National Amendment. So it didn't happen very quickly. Now this image you're looking at is a project that's a national project of the William Pomeroy Foundation and um, the National Votes for Women Trail. It's all across the United States and they provide these markers and um, we um, design them and research them and they're, uh, these are approved for Nevada in those five towns. Carson is installed, Las Vegas is installed, Tonopah is installed. Um, Battle Mountain was going to be uh, dedicated uh, this year, but they have put it off to next year. And Reno is still in the planning stage to produce the marker. So these are a wonderful thing, and there's a big map, and you should follow them all across the United States. So Nevada is very proud to be part of that project. That was orchestrated by um, Dr. Joanne Goodwin at UNLV, and the Nevada Women's History Project just helped her where we could. But all the credit goes to Dr. Joanne Goodwin at UNLV. So Nevada was women's suffrage is um, we got the right to vote six years before the National Amendment in 1914. And we love this map. It's called the Black Spot because all of the states around us have full suffrage, the white states, and there's Nevada. And so the, it was get rid of the black spot. So, as and we did, we did on November the 3rd, 1914. But as part of this, we have this uh, women's suffrage website that 
we got a grant from Nevada Humanities to produce. So when you are uh, browsing and you want to know, this is the site to go. We have a very good timeline and um, you just run down it and then all these orange things are hot links and it just tells you about Nevada suffrage. So I don't have to do that now. You can look it up. We have biographies of suffragists and we have 60 plus of these up of women who worked across Nevada for suffrage. So um, that is just something I wanted to show you. So there's a thing about are we suffragists or suffragettes? And we are suffragists because uh, suffragettes are what they called the British women who were getting the right to vote. And they were uh, reputably quite militant. And uh, the United States as a rule was not, and the West specifically was not. So Anne Martin is the main uh, player in Nevada suffrage. She was the president of the Nevada Equal Franchise Society. And so this is her telling us to call ourselves suffragists. So if you all would do the same, that would be appreciated. So these are what it was like in the 20s. It was the heyday of, of this kind of, uh, I don't know if it's Art Deco or Art Nouveau, but very much of the suffrage literature is in this with this flowing woman. Um, the colored one, that's probably Columbia. And the other one is the Statue of Justice. And she is putting 1914 on the map for Nevada. And it says two more bright spots because both Montana and Nevada got the vote the same year. So then the West was complete. And so then the colored one, the ladies from the East were really wanting her to come and save them. So in night, two years after we got the right to vote, all these ladies in the East were going, they were trying to get the Western suffragists to help them get the vote. There was very much cooperation between states in the West and the people running the national program in the East. And Alice Paul, it says down here, Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage Chair, developed this plan for a train and her train you can see it left Washington DC and went to Chicago and went around and down and around and down and ended up in Reno and then it went to Carson City down here and then it went back to Sacramento and up to Seattle before it went back to Washington and they called their train the suffrage special and that's where the name of this uh, project we're working on comes from, is this suffrage special. And they only went to those states that already had the right to vote, which is kind of interesting because they thought those ladies can, can help them get it. So they arrived in Reno on late on April the 26th. On the 27th, they went to Carson City to see Governor Emmett Boyle. And, um, and then they came back to Reno, um, did a big convention at the Majestic Theater in Reno, and then, then they left. So they were just here a short time, but they left a big impact on Nevada. And the research for this came about because of this picture of the, with the governor standing in front of the Capitol. We've for on our website for a year. We've had this picture up. Can you identify these women and nobody could and It's because it turns out That they aren't Nevadans and so to show you that the other photo of the lady standing out is Absolutely the suffrage train returning to Washington DC and we tracked this lady, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, because her hat is so distinctive, and there she is right there with the governor, and we see her in more places. And so we're uh, extremely confident that we've nailed this and that that picture is not the Nevada suffragists that were there 
in the picture you're going to see in a minute. So um, they went to meet Governor Boyle. And these are some of the prominent women who spoke at the Majestic Theater that night to uh, many, many people, men and women alike. And um, the keynote speaker was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And in, and in suffrage history, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and Susan B. Anthony were the first movers and shakers. And so her daughter is continuing on that tradition. Lucy Burns is also uh, a big name in suffrage. And uh, this Florence uh, Hills is the lady I was just talking about. And we didn't know her name before, but we think she's quite prominent. So following their speaking, the suffrage special left Reno. So here we go, and now it's 1920, and a lot of very prominent women in Washoe County and other places in the state, but primarily Washoe County because they had access to the governor, um, had convinced uh, Governor Emmett Boyle to call a special session to ratify what was called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Uh, we know it as the 19th Amendment, but at the time it was called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. And so they knew that they all wanted to go down there and be a part of that very important day of ratifying the, um, the 19th Amendment to get Nevada in one of the 36 states required. Three quarters of the states have to ratify the amendment for it to go into the Constitution. So they went down there, and you see their train. They called it the Suffrage Special. And that was in honor of that other train that went all the way across the United States uh, earlier. So um, they put this big banner down the sides of their train. Well, it wasn't very popular with the... B and T when they got to Carson City, because um, the banner was gone when they were done with the day, and nobody ever knew what it happened to it. We don't know what it looked like for sure. The newspaper articles call it white muslin with black letters, and so the Nevada Women's History Project has produced a 40-foot long white muslin banner with black letters that says "Suffrage Special." and the Nevada State Railroad Museum is going to put it on the very identical car that they're referring to in this quote from 1920. The, the coach car number 17 will have the suffrage special on it, but I'm sure Wendell's gonna talk about that. So this is just because you have to know what the words say. This whole thing is about a constitutional amendment to the United States Constitution. So here it is. And the only part that is the actual wording is this little teeny piece here in the middle. And the rest of it is <clears throat> what they have to do at the legislature. So the Senate was unanimous in the assembly vote. There was one dissenter. And his rationale was quite good. His name is uh, Ferguson, and he was from Eureka. And he said he voted no because he only represented the people of Nevada, and he didn't think he could represent anyone else in the United States. And so he voted no so that their states could pass it like we had done earlier. Uh, but it passed, and Nevada was then the 28th state to ratify uh, the 19th Amendment towards making it a constitutional amendment. Now, we did that on February the 7th, 1920. The last state to do it was Tennessee, and that was August the 18th. So it took another six months to get enough states to actually do it. So on the day of the special session, there was one woman in the Nevada legislature. 
and she was the first woman in the Nevada legislature. She was elected four years after we gained the right to vote. Her name was Sadie Dodson Hurst, and there she is. And so she was a Republican from Washoe County. And when they met, it, they broke protocol. Instead of the Speaker of the Assembly, they had Sadie introduce the legislation and call the vote. And so that was wonderful. And then that made her the very first woman in the United States to um, preside over a state legislature. So down here is a link. Uh, the Nevada Women's History Project is uh, known for our biographies. We have a very wonderful biographies website at this nevadawomen.org, and that's a link to Sadie's full biography. So after it was official, some of these women and men went over to the governor where he signed it. And Sadie is right behind him. Uh, and then to her right is the speaker of the assembly. And we know some of these women, um, the Nevada Women's History Project, that's how this project got started, is we were asked to find out who these women were and if we could write some biographies. So this picture is how this whole thing started. And here are a few of those ladies. Now Felice Cohen, I say sister Felice Cohen, Felice was a lawyer at the time and she wrote the actual legislation. There is Sadie Hurst and she's the one who I told you about that was the first woman and presided over the session. And then here is the very important picture that started all of this work because we wanted to know if we could identify these women 100 years later. Well, we could mostly because they were club women. They were women in the Federation of Women's Clubs and they were in the paper and there were lots of ways um, that they got their images there. Not all of them, but some of them. And the Nevada Historical Society has um, treasures. And so we um, could find out quite a bit of this. So, okay now, so here are some of these ladies. They, we have uh, suffrage biographies for each of these ladies uh, on our websites. And so I'm not gonna, you might recognize some of these names. The reason we wanted to know who they were is because in honor of the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote, the Nevada Commission for Women arranged and orchestrated the reenactment of this photo. And so there's Governor Sisolak, and Mrs. Sisolak is right behind him. And there, the next slide is very busy and full of words, so only look at the boldface underlined ones because that's who the people are in the picture. So uh, this reenactment happened right before we got the pandemic and the, otherwise this would never have happened. I want to point out the two women in this picture that represented the Nevada Women's History Project. We were honored to be in this photo because um, we had done so much historic research for them. So this, can you see my cursor? This is Patty Bernard, the current chair and the inspiration for this presentation. And this is me over here. So we are very proud of that. And so now here's the list because people want to know. See, we have former first ladies. We have <clears throat> Governor Bryan, Senator Bryan, Mayor of Henderson, so it was, and all of the elected women that are in the offices, controller, secretary of state. So this was really an amazing photograph. So, okay. Now, great stories take great research. So like I've been saying sort of along, we were doing this because um, 
We wanted to look for the names in that 1920 picture. And then those two photos showed up, the one with the governor on the steps and the one of him signing it. And at the Historical Society, they both have the same dates, but they have different clothes and they were different women. So then you go, okay, there's a challenge. So we knew that the ratification photo was the right one. And then when you put in suffrage special, because we knew the name of the train from Carson City to uh, Reno and back was called the suffrage special. Well, then you run into this 1916 one and you kind of have to, and that's led us to these other things. So um, <clears throat> we learned in this research that the VNT had to add extra cars to that train because there were so many people. The legislators were on that train and there were about 50 of these women that wanted to come down and be a part of it. So uh, Patty uh, knows a railroad researcher named Dennis Beagley and she asked him about it and then they went to uh, Stephen Drew who is at the California State Railroad Museum, and he sent them up to you and our special collections for the train registers. So that's when we started talking to the State Railroad Museum, and both groups are very excited about this, and what we have done is created, oh, let's go back. We're gonna have, on August the 15th, the suffrage special is going to run again. I'm going past this bib. So here it is, uh, when and where, and there's two places you can get advanced tickets online. And um, the first class is car number four, and they, it's the first and probably only time that that car will be used. So that's a very special thing. So here's the bibliography, and I know it's little and busy. I don't expect you to pay attention to it, but later if you look at the presentation and you want to know what the sources are, these are the primary sources we use to find uh, the information on the two suffrage specials. So this is me. If anybody ever wants to call me or uh, email me, I'd be happy to reply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mona. We appreciate uh, your presentation. Next up is uh, is Wendell Huffman, and he's our he's the museum's curator of history. What you're looking at is a photograph of Car 17. Uh, car 17 was a regular passenger coach on the Virginian Truckee Railroad for roughly 60 years. It was one of the longest cars, and I'm sure that's the reason it was used on that particular occasion. Um, I'm always looking for stories about these cars. Passenger cars really did nothing but carry passengers back and forth between Reno and Virginia City. Uh, the one thing we knew about this car was that it had been a private car. Um, and before I tell you that story though, it may be interesting to you to know how we know that this is the car that was on the 1920 suffrage special, how this is the one that had the banner on it. Um, first place, the newspaper said the banner was 40 foot long, and there are really only a handful of cars on the railroad that were long enough to accommodate a 40 foot banner. So that narrowed it down quite a bit to start with, but really you want to get documentation if you can. Uh, what you're looking at is a, is a train register. This sheet of paper is about two feet wide and maybe 18 inches tall. And the railroad kept this kind of documentation on all their trains. And basically what this is showing you is the different trains that were run each day and the crew that was on that train and the times that they got to these various stations. But what you're wanting to look at is down here and the next slide, if this works, is going to be that close up. What you're looking at here, uh, this, this says engine 25. Uh, instead of number 11 on train one from Carson. So they've changed the locomotive so that it's a heavier locomotive going north to Reno on Friday night. And number one also picks up 
two cars, two coaches in Carson. There's number four and number 17. The 17 is back behind Mona. Um, Try that. This one? Yeah. No. So the next slide is for Saturday. And this is the day of the train that go, that's the suffrage special. And notice originally they had written two extra coaches. Uh, they, had named, they had taken car four and car 17 down there. But in fact, when they actually started counting bodies, they only needed car 17. And so they didn't take car four. Um, and the reason we know that 17 is the one is because it was the one that had the 40 foot banner. It was of the two cars, it's the only one that would carry a 40 foot banner. This is the very beginning of the newspaper, of one of the newspaper articles that talks about the banner being taken off the car when it got to Carson City. So anyway, here's our coach, coach 17 that was on the VNT. They used it for various occasions for 60 years. Um, but before it was a coach, what we did know about it was it had been a private car. Uh, this is a floor plan of it. It was built in 1868 by the Central Pacific in Sacramento. And it was a private car. And, and by that, it regular, rather than being a regular coach uh, that passengers would ride in, it was for the the highfalutin people that had a, a, they had a bedroom, there was a parlor, a dining room, a kitchen, uh, there was generally a steward. When the Central Pacific built it, Charlie Crocker is the one that wanted the thing built, and he wanted to take this back to New York when the railroad was completed to show them what they could do in California. In fact, that did not happen, but they used it on the railroad uh, whenever he would make inspection trips, the federal government had inspectors. And once you were east of Reno, there were really were, there were very few places that had a hotel that you could stay in. And so rather than camping, you had this RV on wheels. This is a photograph from 19, um, I'm sorry, from 1869, very early in the year. This is the first photograph we have of the car and that's this car back here. It had its own, um, they called it a subsistence car. This is what they carried their supplies in because they were basically roughing it when they were out in the middle of Nevada. The thing that was made this car very famous um, in May of 1869, when Leland Stanford went back to Promontory uh, for the driving of the Gold Spike, this is the car he rode in because this was the car with the bedroom. He and half a dozen of his closest friends um, and the, the spikes. There were three gold spikes and one silver spike from Nevada. And they all rode in this car. This is at Monument Point at the north end of, of, of Salt Lake. And they're on their way to, to Promontory for the driving of the gold spike. This is a picture um, after the gold spike ceremony. The two locomotives are still facing each other. Uh, the people generally are in their various private cars on the Union Pacific Railroad or back here in car 17 um, or, or the Central Pacific's private car. It wasn't car 17 yet. Um, this is a great picture because this is the picture that actually places our car at Promontory on that occasion. Following this event, uh, Charlie Crocker and his brother used it as a private car. As far as we know, Charlie Crocker never had it farther east than Chicago, um, but we think his brother E.B. Crocker took it all the way to New York. This is a picture taken in Reno in 1872. It's tacked onto the, the tail end of the regular train. It still has its subsistence car, and this is the car that became car 17 on the V&T. Um, in 1875, the Central Pacific sold it. Uh, it became the property of their attorney, Alfred Cohen. Uh, he and his uh, buddy, D.O. Mills, who you've probably have heard of, Mills Park is named after D.O. Mills. Um, 
they used it occasionally uh, going coast to coast. And then in 1876, it was sold to the V&T. Uh, Mills was very much involved with the V&T, and uh, he was a good friend of William Sharon. William Sharon had been president of the railroad. He was elected to the U.S. Senate and knew that he'd be making several trips across the country, and he wanted a private car. So the V&T bought the car, uh, and it became a private car that Sharon used, um, and a few others. Uh, John Mackey used it to go to the World's Fair or to the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia uh, in 1876. And, um, and that was about the end of its story as a private car. Uh, in, the car wasn't even 10 years old yet. The railroad technology had changed. New private cars like this one that was built for D.O. Mills um, had six-wheel trucks rather than the four-wheel trucks. They were smoother. They were 10 to 20 feet longer. Instead of having just one bedroom, uh, they had several bedrooms, uh, a bigger dining room because they had more people. And if you're rich enough to have a private car, and believe me, William Sharon was rich enough to have a private car, you didn't want a second-rate car. And the car that the V&T had was really a second-rate car. And so they took it into the shop uh, in Carson City and converted it into a coach. This is the interior of the coach. The railroad numbered it number 17, and, and that is what it was known as for the next 60-odd um, years. This is the earliest photograph of it on the V&T. It's this last car on this train going across the Crown Point trestle about 1890. And this is probably the last picture of it on the V&T. This is a picture of it at the end of a, a rail fan trip in 1938. Um, this is going through Washoe Valley. This is Slide Mountain. It's on its way back north. Um, at the end of the year, at the end of 1938, 20th Century Fox came looking for a railroad car. Paramount Studios had already bought most of the cars that were available. Uh, they leased, 20th Century Fox leased this car and then wrote a letter to the railroad uh, saying, sorry, we destroyed it by accident. Uh, what do we owe you for it? And so they paid him for the car. The ironic thing is 20th Century Fox actually ended up paying more for the car than Paramount did for any of the cars that they bought. This is a picture of the car as it was dressed up by 20th Century Fox for a movie called Centennial Summer. The ironic thing about that is that was a movie about the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. And this car was actually at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. I am very confident that there's no one that was involved with that movie that knew it. And in fact, the car basically is eliminated from the movie on the cutting room floor. It only shows up in a distant scene at one time. Uh, 20th Century Fox really didn't use it very much. It stayed out on their ranch uh, in Malibu Canyon, uh, right around the corner from where they filmed MASH. Um, it was used in the movie Kenny Rogers as the gambler, and that's probably what saved the car because they spent a lot of money uh, putting the car back in pretty good condition for that filming. Um, so kudos to, to Kenny Rogers for what he did. The car was later used in, um, in Pale Rider, um, and this is the lettering that it has in Pale Rider. That was the last movie that it was ever in. It came back to Carson City um, about 1980 uh, to the Railroad Museum, 1988, I'm sorry. And um, it was a big car. We didn't know what to do with it. And so it stayed in the back of the building. It had a massive sag in the middle of it, which you can sort of see uh, from this photograph. The one platform had already fallen off one end. This one was on the verge of falling off. Windows were broken. And that's the way the car sat. But as you may well know, a year or two years ago, last year we came up to the 
150th anniversary of the driving of the gold spike. And since this car was actually at Promontory for that event, um, we wanted to put that on exhibit, which, and this actually goes back two or three years before that, as we're approaching that anniversary. Um, the question is, what are we going to do with this car? Um, the problem is there's so much history to this car itself. The car was brand new in 1868, yet there's very little that you see that was there at the time. It was recited in 1912. The windows were changed in the 1880s. Just a whole bunch of different things. Uh, one of the things that the car has, um, there's all these holes on the side of it uh, where the woodpeckers in Malibu Canyon uh, used it to store acorns. And the kids love this car and they call it the acorn car uh, for good reason. As we started tearing it apart, we found it had a very interesting framework inside the wall. This is actually very archaic and it was actually obsolete at the time the car was built. And I think this explains why the Central Pacific got rid of the car so soon is once the Transcontinental Railroad, Railroad is completed and you're building department people begin to go to national conventions, they find out there are better ways to do things. And the problem was if we were going to restore this car to the way it looked in 1869, we wouldn't rebuild it this way uh, because we wouldn't want our work to fall apart. But you can see where um, it's this timber is compressed and, and this explains why there was such a sag in the car. On the inside of the roof, there's a tremendous amount of information. Um, it's behind Mona's picture, but over here is a hole from one of the original um, roof lights. Um, originally, it had these rods across. There's another hole right there where there was a rod across. Uh, because those rods had been, because the rods looked old fashioned. And so the V&T took the rods out at some point in time to make the car look modern. And they put these iron carlins in like this. And in the process of doing that, they cut these uh, longitudinal pieces. The roof had begun to collapse. The, 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 the roof, the top of the car was four inches wider than the bottom because the roof was beginning to cave in on itself. Had this been outside and had snow on it, the car probably would have collapsed several years ago. Ultimately, we made the decision that we were not going to restore the car. We were going to preserve it. Um, there just there was just so little information about what that car looked like on the inside that anything we did would have been a guess. We took the sag out of it. Uh, we leveled the car. We left the woodpecker holes in it. We built new platforms so that we had a place to attach the the handrails and the hard rail, hardware that otherwise would have gotten lost. Uh, it's still lettered the way it was in um, in Pale Rider. And we put it into the front building. Um, we left it exposed so you can see this interesting um, truss work inside. Um, I've shared this the story of this car with uh, a fellow named Jack White that was the former curator of the Smithsonian who wrote a book about the American railroad passenger cars. And his response was, gee, I wish I would have known about that car when I wrote the book 20 years ago because this would have been a featured piece of that. Anyway, when, when Mona and the, the ladies from the Nevada Women's History Project came to us and told us the story of the banner, that gave us a story at the end of this car's life or while it was on the V&T, something to balance the story of it being a private car on the Central Pacific. This was a story of it on the Virginia Truckee Railroad and a place in Nevada history. Uh, so the first thing that I did, uh, just being the curious guy that I am, um, I went to look at the car and see if we could find any nail holes. Um, the newspaper article um, made the point that the railroad was very unhappy because this banner had been nailed to the side of the car and that was private property and the women had no right to do that. Um, and I do not know that this is one of the nail holes, but I think it is. There is a row of holes that are otherwise without explanation on one side of the car 
and there's only reference to one banner. So I think there was a banner on just the one side uh, and they, they stretched the length of the car. I've stuck the paper clip into the hole to make it more obvious of what it is. But, um, and this is a picture of the car as it is today with, with the banner on the side of it. There you go, Mona. This is the first time you get to see it. Um, we have not nailed the banner to the car. We have tied it to the car. Um, and uh, we're very happy to have it. And, and I hope to have it up here for a while because this, this is a very significant connection between our artifact, between the, the railroad car and the 20th Amendment 100 years ago. So here you've got the 100, 150th anniversary of the gold spike or the silver spike, as I like to say, for Nevada spike, um, 150 years ago last year. And this year, the 100th anniversary of the um, of the the 20th Amendment, and Mona, I'm really pleased to have learned uh, about the convention in Battle Mountain. Um, I can't imagine a, a worse place to have a convention, but what the hell, it is Nevada. Um, and I presume, and it was sort of in the center of the state. And thanks to the railroad, you could get there, and and the railroad um, was a tremendously significant thing for the state. Um, I like to point out that the, the, the railroad, the train on the state seal um, is the Transcontinental Railroad because that's what put Nevada on the map. That's what connected it to the rest of the country. Made possible by the generosity of the Estelle J. Kelsey Foundation.